say thank you so much to the team that puts this conference together. Um, I'm really thrilled to be here uh, and invited back. And uh, it's one of my favorite conferences. I love the location. I love the people. I love the size. It's, it's, a, it's just a great show. Uh, and I'm so thrilled that I could be a part of it. So when I meet security people, I really like to ask them the question, what drives the need for security at your organization? Why does your company do security? I think it's like a really important question. Um, and even though it's simple, uh, sometimes the answer is not so straightforward. Um, I also like to ask, how do you decide how much you're going to invest in security? And once, once you've made that decision, how do you decide what you're going to do with that investment? Um, I like to learn about the history of security teams. So I really like to understand how they got started. For example, what was an organization's first security hire uh, and what were they brought in to do? Uh, I've been working in the industry now for 13 years uh, and I started out working on security teams for eBay and for Zynga. And I want to share with you what I was brought there to do. Uh, so eBay security uh, the version that I knew it, I was there from 2005 to 2010, I was really brought in to do compliance. So SOX was a thing, starting in 2002, end of 2004, PCI. And I started at eBay as a security policy analyst in 2005. Um, I started there in compliance, and actually the version of the security team that I joined uh, had been very compliance oriented. Uh, there had been a group of consultants who were doing SOX and PCI projects for the company, and those folks were brought on full time to start the security team, and those are the folks that hired me. In 2007, we got like a real CISO. Uh, Dave Kellanane came over from Washington Mutual, and he he sort of noticed that while we were very focused on compliance, that eBay had a much more important driver for security, and that was application security. He said to our executives, look, the, the business that we do allows strangers to transact with each other on the internet, and we need to make a much greater investment in application security, and so we did. After eBay, I joined the Zynga security team. This was a security team that was put together because there had been some incidents. And they wanted the incidents to stop. So they thought maybe if they hired a security team that the incidents would stop. Uh, the other driver for security at Zynga was that the company was preparing for an IPO. And so they needed to get ready for SOX. What was common to both of these organizations was that each of them had to provide live operations 24 by 7 to millions of simultaneous users daily. At eBay, you know, as security people, we knew sort of first and foremost, availability is king, and eBay had an uptime requirement of 99.994%. At Zynga, we had these massive growth numbers. Uh, in 2009, they launched this game called Farmville. And in a matter of weeks, it went from zero to 10 million daily active users. Within a few months, it was 80 million daily active users. And at the time, they were using Amazon uh, in order to have elastic uh, capacity. Zynga was also really big on the data and analytics front. So we had these huge game stores. A, a, a single game would log a billion or more transactions a day. There was actually one game which was recording 30 billion transactions a day. Um, so really big and interesting numbers. So that's how I got started in security. And then transitioned to the vendor side, did some product management semantic, consulting at Sigital, which is now Synopsys. And in 2016, I joined Cobalt, which is a penetration testing as a service company. So I have a guess, because we're at AppSec California, about 
sort of the demographics of this audience. Uh, so I've had an opportunity to give this talk before, uh, and you know, I go different places, I give this talk, and the audience is filled with different people. So I'm really curious to know who in the audience is an engineer that would not consider themselves a security person. Cool, so like maybe less than 10%, maybe 5% of the room. Um, how many people are security people in this room? Okay, that makes total sense to me. Um, are any of your organizations doing DevOps today in some capacity? Okay, so that's, uh, again, I suppose because of the topic of today's conversation, it makes sense that it would be a little higher than the average, uh, which we'll talk about briefly. Um, and then of the people who are not yet doing DevOps, are your organizations considering doing DevOps? Anyone not doing it but thinking about doing it? Okay, so that helps me uh, to understand uh, what's up. So today we're gonna talk about why DevOps matters. Um, I'm all about asking the really simple questions. Um, I wanna talk about the changing role of security given this massive change in how software is developed. I wanna talk more about why security matters as well as what we can do about it. Um, I'll share a few anecdotes uh, from different places I've worked in the past uh, about how we've gone about doing things uh, and then leave you with a few key takeaways. So I like to have interactive sessions if you guys are up for it. Um, can anyone tell me why DevOps matters? Agility. Why does agility matter? Developers want to move fast, but why? Just like for kicks? <laughs> to deliver the application. Yes. But why? <laughs> yeah, breaking, breaking down barriers so as to make organizations more efficient and more effective. So, yes, any other? Comments on why DevOps matters? Speed to market. Why does that matter? Make money faster. Make money faster. Totally. It's all, about, it's all about making money faster. Thank you. So there is this woman, uh, Dr. Nicole Forsgren. She is brilliant. She runs an organization called the DevOps Research and Assessment Group. And they've gathered over the past four years more than 23,000 data points on DevOps organizations. They've studied the heck out of DevOps organizations. And what she's found is that organizations that adopt DevOps are actually twice as likely to exceed their peers when it comes to commercial goals like profitability, productivity, and market share. So, you know, what her data says is that DevOps organizations are better at making money than non-DevOps organizations. I think that DevOps is what software development has always wanted to be. You come up with an idea for a digital experience and you can quickly turn it into reality. So I asked how many folks in the room like are part of organizations who do DevOps and maybe like half the room raised their hands, which is high. And the reason I say that's high is because Puppet, who's been doing the state of DevOps report for the past four years, as of last year, said that of all the organizations they surveyed, only 27% of them are doing DevOps. So, you know, you attend a conference like this, you read blogs, it can kind of feel like everyone is using DevOps, except for you, if you're not. Uh, but actually, most organizations aren't yet, even if they're starting to think about it. Um, Gartner has also published a number that says, of the Fortune 2000 companies, only 25% of those have adopted DevOps. And I think there's a couple reasons for this. Number one is some organizations outsource all of their software development, and so that's kind of like a hard stopper. Um, another one is, is major change, uh, not only cultural change, which is talked about a lot, but a, a, ch a, a huge change to the way that business is done 
technology is run uh, and, and the talents and the skills that are needed are totally different. If you are moving, for example, from sort of an isolated private data center situation uh, to one that's this sort of cloud vendor ecosystem. On the same note, I also want to say that while, first of all, DevOps is still relatively new, relatively not adopted. Um, there's this security idea that automation is going to kind of solve a lot of problems. And I think automation does solve a lot of problems, but I don't think that automation is the way to solve every problem. Even if we put security aside and we think about software testing, the most commonly automated software tests are still unit tests, integration tests, performance tests. Things like usability and user acceptance and story level testing, namely things that require human input or human opinion, these are things that are much more difficult to automate, and so they're not. And there's a reason for this. There's a reason why not everything can be automated. It's because the users of our applications are humans, and guess what? The people who want to attack your applications are humans too. So how is the role of security changing? I thought about an idea for the next slide that I didn't get to do because I kind of ran out of time. But I'm going to tell you about it, and then I'll put it in the presentation for next time. So I want to have this picture of a waterfall, duh, and this picture of like a sprinter. But then I want to have a picture of a person playing golf. And does anyone know why I would choose to represent Waterfall, Agile, and DevOps, and then the DevOps person playing golf? I'm sorry? Automation. Not because of automation, although I like that guess. Because in golf, you have to do all the things at once. Right? You have to like do your shoulder thing, and you have to do your stance thing, and you have to do, your, and you have to do it all at once. Um, anyway, maybe I won't, because I, like, I feel like that didn't go over so well. That's OK. That's okay. Um, okay, so we're going to talk about we're going to talk about then and now. So ten years ago, uh, you know, as a as a very broad generalization, the job of a security professional was to protect the perimeter. There was this idea that an organization is sort of like an M and M, like hard candy coating on the outside, soft and melty on the inside. And there was almost this idea. I even saw this reflected in uh, people's annual performance goals for security teams. If there were no incidents, and if there were no breaches, then you were like doing great. It was kind of an idea, right? This idea that you could keep attackers at bay. So what else characterized this? Um, you know, in a, in a waterfall software development lifecycle, you've got these phases. So security has an opportunity to inject themselves, put in these gates, do this review and approval thing. Um, and we've also got, you know, historically a, a sense of like a private data center that you have full control over and even, uh, you know, devices that employees are using uh, that are fully managed by an, or an organization. So that's changed, uh, and we have this ecosystem, right? So my company is a software company. We depend on lots of third parties and lots of open source communities to help us write our software. We don't just do it ourselves. And we sell our software to organizations. And so vendor risk is this interesting that I say goes, goes both ways in that we are a vendor and as a vendor, we need to convince our customers to trust us, and we need to convince them that what we're doing is appropriate and safe. Um, and we also have to ask all those questions and do our due diligence on the vendors that work for us. In a situation where infrastructure is code, applications and APIs become that much more important. Um, and then, of course, we've got uh, you know, employees all over the place with their own devices. Um, so things have changed. And fundamentally, I think, whereas in the past, a, a security professional might be able to think conveniently, we're trying to prevent this breach from happening. I think today, people acknowledge, like, like breaches are happening, incidents are happening right now. And instead of trying to prevent them from happening, 
uh, because we sort of just acknowledge the reality that they are happening. And so that changes the way that we look at things. There's, there's a much greater focus on logging and monitoring and detecting uh, an incident rather than so much of a focus on preventing it um, from happening. Uh, Zane Lackey, who's doing another talk on DevOps, I think later today, uh, did one last year as well. And he talks about a difference between then and now and the importance of now being able to provide engineers and developers with sort of security self-sufficiency, uh, sort of self-service. Uh, and I actually, one of the things I'm gonna talk about today is actually the opposite of automation, which is like a really high touch approach to security. Okay, so we talked about why DevOps matters. Uh, I gave a few examples of why security matters for some organizations that I've worked for. Now I'd like to ask you, why does security matter for DevOps? If you're getting stuff out faster, it can be vulnerable much faster. Yes. So the sooner you can detect problems, the sooner they can get fixed. And if you fix them earlier in the software development life cycle, maybe that's an easier thing to do. And that was true then, uh, and it continues to be true now. Any other thoughts? Yes. Yes. Security is an essential part of quality. And if your application is not high quality, then you're gonna have all sorts of problems. Yes, the whole point of DevOps is to make the business successful. And if poor security gets in the way of that, then that's, that's a big problem. Thank you. So, yeah, I have this idea that security matters for DevOps uh, for a few reasons, which all sort of boil down to one reason. So going back to kind of the vendor cloud ecosystem that I mentioned a few moments ago, in this sort of world where we're so highly dependent on our vendors, we are, as a vendor, you know, other people are so dependent on us for their security, Asking questions of others about their security to the extent that it affects your products and your services becomes of critical importance. So um, I'm actually gonna talk about, so Tech Beacon wrote this article, 10 Companies Killing It at DevOps, and I think it's interesting for us to, to take a look and see uh, what the situation is for these folks. Although, for the sake of time, I'm not going to talk through all 10. I'm just going to talk through the top five. Uh, so the first one's Amazon, which may seem pretty obvious. But actually, Amazon.com, you know, there was a time when Amazon.com ran in a private data center on its own servers. And they had this super inefficient capacity situation because during off-peak times, like not right before Christmas, they had all these extra servers that just weren't being used. And so like so many organizations, they moved to AWS. Uh, and, and what I read is that they do code deploys every 11.7 seconds, which is like wild to me. Um, what I've done for each of these slides is I've done like a screenshot uh, to indicate where security features as they're talking about their business. And so this particular slide is obviously um, Amazon, it's not, it's not AWS, but they have this thing about security and privacy because it's important to their business. They, like eBay, are essentially letting strangers transact with each other on the internet. So the next one is Netflix. I think we, I don't know if we have Netflix folks in the room, but we certainly have Netflix here. Um, so Netflix went from shipping DVDs to people's homes uh, to live streaming. And Netflix uh, uses a, a lot of open source and a lot of super smart developers uh, to create their Simeon Army test infrastructure. Uh, and they do code deploys thousands of times a day. I think Netflix is like kind of known for being a pioneer in DevOps. Uh, Target. So 
When I think about why only 27% of organizations surveyed by Puppet are doing DevOps today, I don't know if I actually finished that thought earlier. So you've got organizations that outsource all software development. So in order to do DevOps, they'd have to first bring that in-house. Next, you've got sort of this huge cultural business technology shift that would need to happen. And while some of that 27% of organizations doing DevOps are companies that were sort of born in the cloud, so they like started and they were doing cloud stuff and they were doing DevOps stuff from the front from the beginning, you know, you also have a ton of existing organizations that are starting to slowly shift maybe. Uh, and that's hard, right? If you have years of development teams and operations teams sort of you know, battling with each other, that's not something that's going to change overnight. Um, and so when I look at how organizations that do make the switch, how do they do it, um, usually I find that it starts in like a little corner of the organization. And then if it's successful, it spreads from there. And that's exactly what happened at Target. So Target, uh, there was almost this like grassroots initiative for DevOps, um, and one of the teams that was all about it uh, is called Cartwheel. So it's like their coupon app, uh, which is now integrated into the Target app. Uh, and, and culturally, Target would do things like host and participate in DevOps Days. So DevOps Days Minneapolis, uh, which is where Target's headquarters is located, um, is, is one of the things uh, that they did. <coughs> so Walmart is on the list. And Walmart came to DevOps in a different way, which is that they acquired a company, and that company is doing DevOps. So they've got Walmart Labs, which is their tech innovation and development arm, uh, coincidentally run by one of the former executives of eBay. Um, so I think that's another way that DevOps can be brought to an organization, is via acquisition. Uh, and then Nordstrom. So Nordstrom, around 2011 or so, they were developing this app, and you know they're trying to get people to buy stuff. And, and it takes them two and a half years to develop their app. And by the time the app is live, it's like already out of date. Uh, so they were like, okay, we need to make a shift. Uh, and they went, they went DevOps. So, I, I have this idea that there are three, oops, that there are three main reasons why security matters for DevOps. The first is for sales or acquisition. If your organization sells stuff, and a lot of our, our organizations do sell stuff, uh, then the people we're selling that stuff to have questions about our security. Because the way that these things work today, if I'm selling my stuff to someone, then they actually really care about what I'm doing with their data, and especially if the software that I'm selling them becomes part of their products and services, and they're taking on that risk uh, if they're gonna work with us. So vendor security assessments today, I think, are a really major way in which security is being driven into organizations. And this is super different from how it used to be in the past, right? Because security in the past used to be this cost center um, where they would say, okay, fine, we have to spend money on security. What are we going to take away from? Now, it's actually a business driver because it's part of the sales and procurement process. So, you know, two organizations have talked, they've decided they want to work together, you know, and now in the procurement process, you know, one of the organizations needs to prove to the other that they have a sufficient level of security. So security is really becoming a business driver, which is really different from sort of the cost center model of the past. Another reason why I think security matters is because organizations don't want to have negative press associated with security incidents and breaches. But if I think about that for another moment, isn't the reason that organizations don't want bad press associated with security incidents because they don't want something to get in the way of their sales or in the way of their acquisitions? The Verizon acquisition of Yahoo, for example. After the breach occurred, Verizon basically got like a $480 million discount off of their acquisition. And that's, that's a really big business driver. Uh, so yeah, press, 
kind of the same thing. Um, compliance, uh, certainly, certainly very important uh, and sort of traditionally uh, a big stick when it comes to doing security things. Uh, if you work for the type of organization that must be HIPAA compliant, must be PCI compliant in order to do business, uh, then you're then you're more likely to do these security things. Uh, but again, in my mind, it really just all comes back to sales and acquisition because the reason that you're doing these compliance things is just so you can have a seat at the table so you can do your business. So for this next slide, um, it's kind of funny what happens when you Google and you're looking for an image for your slide and you're trying to find a picture of a CISO sleeping soundly at night. Uh, it turns out, I think when you Google like any type of human sleeping at night, you get all sorts of like really inappropriate images. <laughs> so what I have is this cat. <laughs> Uh, and the cat is intended to represent the fourth reason why security matters for DevOps, which is so that the CISO, or in many cases, particularly for organizations that were born into DevOps and don't have a CISO, but in which the vice president of engineering, vice president of infrastructure, is also responsible for security, so that that person can sleep better at night. So I want to take a look at um, something which was like a big deal in the history of security for software, uh, which is the Trustworthy Computing Memo by Bill Gates. So there was a ton of media about this. This was a really big deal. A lot of security organizations really looked at this as like sort of the gold standard, like, oh, you know, Bill Gates did this trustworthy computing thing at Microsoft. That was really cool. Wouldn't it be cool if we could do something? So I looked at the memo because I wanted to understand why, why this was the case. Uh, and actually, before I looked at the memo, I talked to somebody who worked there. So anyway, over the last year, it has become clear that ensuring that .NET is a platform for trustworthy computing is more important than any other part of our work. If we don't do this, people simply won't be willing or able to take advantage of all the great work we do. Bill Gates is saying to his teams that security, or lack thereof, is getting in the way of their sales. And if they don't fix security, they're not going to be able to make sales. They're not going to be able to make money. So what was you know, maybe perceived as sort of this noble cause really had a big business driver behind it. It's all about the money. So what's a person supposed to do? Um, so now that we've established, OK, DevOps is important. Security is important, application security is important. What do you do? You could go and talk to some security vendors. And there are thousands of security vendors to talk to. Even if you had a really open door policy for security vendors, I mean, you could see five security vendors a day every day for a whole year, you know, and you wouldn't get to meet with every security vendor and hear their pitch. So maybe that's not an efficient way to decide what to do. There are also these frameworks. There are super smart people who come up with these prescriptive and descriptive ways to think about application security. And I want to take a, a look at some of them. So BSIM is one. Uh, BSIM is near and dear to my heart. I had the opportunity while working at Sigital to perform BSIM assessments, about three dozen of them over three years. And the thing about BSIM is that it has a list of 113 things that you could do in application security. That's a lot of things. It's <laughs> a lot of things. Um, that's a lot of things to just like read on a piece of paper, right? Let alone do. Um, there are also, of course, ISO standards. Uh, 27017 is focused on the cloud. Uh, it costs 150 bucks. I did the Google. Uh, you know, uh, money conversion uh, from Swiss francs. So you, first of all, you have to pay 150 bucks to even find out what it says. And then you get there, and it has 121 things. Uh, there is also actually ISO 27034, uh, which is focused on application security, uh, but it's not quite so prescriptive. So that's, on one hand, maybe useful, maybe not. Um, lots of things, like too many things, right? Too many things to do. 
So then we've got the CSA, Cloud Security Alliance. They have their cloud controls matrix, 133 things. So for a person like a VP of engineering who has been born into DevOps and needs to do application security, maybe for the first time, you know, he or she looks around to see well, where do I get started and the frameworks that are available uh, can be very overwhelming. And it can kind of be so overwhelming that you might just decide not to do it. So security for DevOps. Uh, I think this gentleman nailed it when he said, DevOps is about the business being successful, and if security gets in the way, then that's a problem. So in DevOps, it's about going fast. Why is it about going fast? Because the faster you can make something a reality, the faster you can make money off of it. The faster you can get happy customers, the faster you can get those transactions to go through. When you apply security to DevOps, it's really about understanding that something that's insecure is going to, at some point, result in some unplanned work and some rework, which takes away from the planned work that DevOps uses to make the business successful in the first place. It's also really about trust, because for engineers, and this is not new, but their time is really valuable. Um, and in order to say to a developer or an engineer, hey, I need some of your time, and this is what we're gonna do with it. And if you go to them and you say, look, I've got this list of 130 things that we need to talk about, you know, they're probably just not gonna meet with you anymore. They're probably gonna <laughs> ignore your emails, um, and they're probably just gonna, you know, not work with you, which is sort of not the point. So I wanna talk about uh, an idea for how we can effectively do security for DevOps. So there is this frame, so there's another framework. There are all these frameworks, right? There is a recent-ish framework. Uh, this one came out in 2013. Uh, President Barack Obama issued an executive order titled Improving Critical Infrastructure Security. And I don't know if his administration like kind of did this on purpose. Maybe it was just the way in which the winds were blowing. Uh, but it was like perfectly timed for DevOps because the whole point of this particular framework is that it's supposed to enhance the security and the resilience of critical infrastructure and like whatever else, right? It doesn't have to just apply to critical infrastructure. It's certainly not applicable only to the United States. And maintain a cyber environment that encourages efficiency, innovation, and economic prosperity. So even actually the driver behind putting together the NIST CSF was about economic prosperity. It wasn't to get in the way, right? The, other, the others are not intended to get in the way. That's totally not how they were put together. But they have the side effect sometimes, depending on how they're used, of getting in the way. This one was intentionally put together not to be in the way. The other thing I really like about this is there's five categories, and it's all about an incident. So it's sort of, first of all, focuses on the thing that most people are really actually concerned about when it comes to security, non-security people are actually concerned about when it comes to security, which is an incident happening. And the whole framework is all about an incident happening. So I think it's got a really appropriate focal point for today. So there are these five pillars, and I actually am gonna even like simplify them. So identify, you know, what what's going on, um, prevent preventative controls, including thank you, including um, you know, detecting things but also fixing them and obviously preventing them. And then we've got detect, respond, and recover. For the sake of simplicity, I'm actually gonna boil it down one step further and just say identify, prevent, and react. Because I think these are really digestible. If you frame a security program with these three components, that can make sense to a lot of people. So I'm gonna tell you uh, some of the things that we did. Um, I'm gonna tell you some of the things that we did at Zynga uh, in each of these areas. 
Uh, before I dive in there, I want to mention, well, I can just, I can just go for this. So, so identify, uh, learn the business, collaborate, and recognize dependencies. I, I spoke on a panel at a non-security conference, uh, the DevOps Enterprise Summit, a couple of months ago in San Francisco. And it's fascinating, actually, because my whole career, I've only attended security conferences. And then I went to this like non-security conference, and it's a little different. It's kind of cool, actually. Um, and it was also interesting because I'm also more familiar with standing in front of a room of security people and talking about security, which is a relatively easy thing to do. At least we're like kind of on the same page. Um, but in this scenario, I'm actually standing on a panel and I'm like the one security person and I'm talking to a whole bunch of not security people. And so that was different because I really got to understand the other side of things. And so this one engineer raises his hand and he says to me, Caroline, here's why security is a pain for me. He says, they just give me this massive pile of bugs. And he says to me, I want to do the right thing. I really do. I really, I really take pride in my code and I really want it to be secure. But I don't know what to do with this pile of bugs. He's like, I don't get any guidance on what I'm supposed to do with it. They, they just like dump it in my lap and there's nothing I can do with it. How am I supposed to know? And so I think it's really critical to understand that some applications matter more than others from a risk perspective, from a business critical perspective, and some bugs matter more than others too. And it's not just the role of security to make that call. Actually, that's a collaborative process because it involves understanding how would you know what matters more, this application or this one, this bug or this one. So I'll tell you what we did at Zynga for application security. Uh, we actually talked to the, to the development teams, like a lot, imagine that, uh, to understand their games, to understand their business and understand what mattered. And we came up with this way of presenting the data. So for each game studio, we would give them a studio risk profile. And we would update this every week based on what we knew about the game's architecture, what the game was doing next, what their latest features and functions were, as well as all the bugs that we found doing internal pen testing. So we had this y-axis that was aggregate security bug risk, and we had this x-axis that was value to attackers. And for every organization, the value to attackers is going to be different. So in our case, we had things like on the low end, there were bugs that allowed you to cheat in a game. And there are some ways where cheating is like less important than others. So if, so if you have this game and you've got these goods and you can duplicate them, then that's cheating. But maybe it doesn't matter so much because you're not hurting anyone else. So it's like relatively low priority. If there is, however, a type of bug where you can steal from someone and you're not supposed to, that's a bigger deal. That's, that's, a, that's a higher value to attackers bug. Uh, there was also this phenomenon, Zynga was like a really big deal for a while, where s bugs and security bugs would be talked about on forums. And so you'd have like all these people and they were like, yeah, we play Yeovil, we're going to talk about, you know, the security bug. Um, and, and, if, if, and if one of the, you know, potential vulnerabilities was discussed on a forum or if a demo of it was available on YouTube, all of a sudden, the value to, to attackers went way up, and that was super important. We also had this shared technology group, and we had sort of a, like a, you know, generic game called Exampleville, uh, where where you'd take code from Exampleville and you'd make it into your next Cityville, Frontierville, you know, Xville, um, and so, of course, if you had a security bug in Exampleville and then you made a new game with it, then all of a sudden you have the, the same bug in two places. Um, so bugs in Exampleville were also super important. Um, lastly, because of the nature of our games, you've got these in-game goods, you've got these you know, goods that are being exchanged, some of them have an active secondary market, which would also uh, make, make these things higher. So we have this graph uh, and, and we, talk to people about, here's the bugs and here's the ones that matter. We even said like, 
you know, here are the ones in the red zone. Those, those are the ones that really matter. So we're not saying, here's this ginormous pile of bugs. We're saying, we know about this pile of bugs, and, and we're going to tell you the ones that, that really need to be fixed and why. And, and we've actually figured out the why by talking to you and doing threat modeling. Which, by the way, with regards to threat modeling, we made training available to all the game studios so that they could be the ones. So we weren't just doing the threat modeling. We were actually teaching them to do the threat modeling so they could design future iterations of the games with an intelligent eye towards security. Uh, and finally, in the identify category, another really big thing for Zynga was dependencies. So dependencies on AWS as a cloud, cloud platform provider, uh, as well as on Facebook. So we'd have a bug, and we wouldn't be able to fix it until Facebook put their, their fix in place. Um, so another really important area to, again, develop actually those high-touch relationships. We did a lot of really high-touch threat modeling, and pen testing, where we were extremely engaged with the developer teams in order to not only find the security issues, but figure out what mattered. So on the prevent front, uh, we did some training. Uh, I'll talk a little bit more about uh, Exampleville, and then I'll talk about technical debt. And actually, someone made the comment about uh, in DevOps, things move really fast, and that also means that there's a faster way for vulnerabilities to be introduced. Uh, there's a sweet flip side to that that I'll talk about briefly. Um, so when it comes to awareness, uh, one of the things we did was we offered app set classes. This was custom built in-person training for developers and product managers. Uh, after each class, we actually asked them what they thought about the value, the relevance, and the practical application of what we had taught them, because we didn't want to waste their time. We really wanted to make sure that the information we were providing them was actually useful. Um, and then we asked them to give us a score out of 10 for technical level for the class and tell us if they thought that was appro appropriate. Um, we couldn't do it in person everywhere, so we recorded the classes so that they were available for international game studios and for people who just, you know, because of scheduling reasons, couldn't attend the class. For the senior developers, we did hacking exposed classes. So again, actually super high touch. These were in-depth, hands-on classes where we talked about specific vulnerabilities that were actually relevant to what they were working on, exploit techniques, mitigation strategies. Um, with regards to the shared code, I talked about Exampleville. So it kind of goes both ways, right? Because if in Exampleville you have good code and that gets replicated, fantastic. Uh, if you have bad code and it gets replicated, you know, then, then your problem has just spread. Um, and so here's kind of a funny thing about the technical debt and about the code changing all the time. So we would you know, do the various types of defect discovery that we did in order to find bugs. And we would keep track of those bugs, open and active and blah. And um, we actually found that sometimes we'd be keeping track of these bugs and we'd notice like, hey, you know, these bugs have been hanging around for a while. Uh, they're not really going away. Uh, and then we'd go and check, you know, the next week and the entire game would have been re-architected. And there would have been code changes and totally new code and voila, the vulnerabilities are gone too. So it kind of works both ways, which is to say when re-architecture happens, sometimes tons of vulnerabilities go away too. When new code happens, that code can actually be better than the previous code in all sorts of ways, including security. Um, so React. Um, the one thing I'll sort of briefly mention here is that when I was doing, cool, good timing actually, I've got five minutes left. Um, when I was doing BSIMs, so there's 113 things for BSIM, uh, and one of them has to do with sharing threat intelligence and using information from incidents, either attempted or successful, to educate the rest of the organization. And I did like three dozen BSIM assessments. Uh, and the vast majority of organizations that I spoke to to my surprise, uh, didn't actually share incident information with the rest of their organization. It was sort of like culturally this like super top secret thing. At Zynga, we did something different, which was when an incident occurred, we would tell people about it. We sent out these security alerts when things would happen like we noticed that malicious email attachments were getting sent to our executive staff. 
And so we'd tell them. And while we had technology, our important place to strip those malicious attachments out, we wanted to tell them what was going on. And it actually increased their trust uh, in our team. There were things, especially leading up to the IPO, where there would be these social engineering sort of like recon attempts on employees uh, to try and get information about them so we'd notice it and then we'd tell everyone about it. Um, and then there were also things that applied actually both to employees as well as users of the applications. So you'd get like a Facebook friend request from a, an organization called Zynga Security. And we'd say like, hey, that's not us. So. Just a few uh, anecdotes uh, from those days. So key takeaways, uh, security for DevOps has to support the business. I asked why a bunch of times today, and it's a super simple question, but I think it's a super important one as well. Why DevOps, why security, why specifically for your organization? Security for DevOps must be collaborative. I think that automation certainly has a place, and of course, it's the, it's the well-understood, mature, repeatable processes that do not require human input that I believe are the best candidates for automation, of which there are tons, um, but there are some things that require a human opinion, and there are some things, like dealing with people, <laughs> that really go better when you have a high touch things like threat modeling exercises and penetration testing. And I think security for DevOps really has just got to fit a culture of trust. And we were not perfect at this, right? There were times when you know, we had an idea and we wanted to run it by a technical team and they would just ignore us because you know, they thought that we were just going to bring them trouble. Um, so we weren't perfect. Um, but I think that to assume that the technology folks are competent and that they have good intentions and to share information with them uh, is really important. So I think we're, I think we're out of time, uh, but maybe we could do like a question. Question? Okay, well if not, um, I'll be around and I, if anyone wants to chat about this stuff, I would love to talk to you about it. Um, so yeah, let me know. Thank you so much for coming. Okay.